Right. So, hello. Okay, hi, I'm John Kramer. I'm a professor at the University of Washington. Uh, and in the 1980s, uh, I invented an alternate version, uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's called the transactional interpretation. And the basic idea behind it is that if you look at the formalism of quantum wave mechanics, uh, there are these uh, wave functions called psi, that you use the symbol psi, and there are equal well, yeah, numbers the of, the when you're doing calculations, the of the complex conjugate of those wave functions, given the symbol psi star. <laughs> And if you take a wave function that looks like e to the minus i omega t, which is the usual form, and take its complex conjugate, you get something that looks like e to the plus i omega t, and you can interpret that as being a, an advanced wave which is going backwards in time and, so, uh, and carries negative energy backwards in time, rather than a, a normal wave which carries positive energy far, forwards in time. So, uh, the transaction interpretation that takes that seriously <coughs> based on the ideas of Wheeler and Feynman who had a, a, a classical electrodynamics that worked in more or less the same way uh, and envisions that in any quantum mechanical uh, process that transfers mass and energy and momentum and uh, other conserved quantities that uh, the, uh, <coughs> there's a handshake between a retarded wave going from a past to the future, and an advanced wave ratifying the transaction going from the future to the past, shaking hands and, and, tra transfer and arranging for the transfer of energy in much the same way that banks transfer money by sending messages back and forth over the internet. So how far does this transaction occur? How far apart physically? It doesn't matter. Uh, Across the universe? It could happen light years away. Um, and how do you? In, in other words, if I look up in the sky and look at a star uh, and see light coming from the star, the light is shining in my direction at some level because advanced waves from my eyes have gone back to the star and shook, shake, shaken hands with certain atoms and molecules and directed the light in my direction. So, can you send information across the uh, transactional model? Um, the. the there, there's an issue of causality which is difficult to deal with. The, the, the transactional model is a little looser in terms of, of forbidding uh, uh, retrocausal processes than the, nor, the, nor, the normal Let me way back of up saying to, things. When you say there's a problem with causality, what uh, you're not saying that causality is a law that, that only causal things can happen, are you? I, I'm saying that if you want... Uh, uh, let's see how to say this. If you want the, uh, if you want to preserve normal causality, in, in the context of the transactional interpretation, you have to say that certain things are allowed and other things are not allowed. In other words, that, that after the uh, handshake takes place, there's no residual advanced effects that uh, that are left over that allow you to send backwards in time messages. That's not. That's not implicit in the formalism, but it's something that you sort of have to put in by hand if you want to get ordinary causality. As far as I'm concerned, it's something that should be experimentally tested. Yeah. Um. Well, it's, it seems to me that causality is a nice idea, but to, to say it has to be, nature has to be causal, I mean, there's a lot of other weird things that we're discovering in quantum, so why are we... Yeah. Why are we restricting our observation to causal effects? Yeah, another way of saying it is that, that causality is probably the least well understood law of, of, of physics that we... Uh, is there such a thing as a law of causality? Well, I think people talk about the law of causality and apply it in, 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 as if it were a law. But there's but nothing it, but foundational it, about it, is there? It? It's something you have to put in by hand uh, in order to match observations that we see that, that causes in general precede their effects. Um, well, but that's because we have observational mechanisms that assume causality. It's like saying time flows forward because all the clocks in the world go forward. Uh, we only look for causal effects, and we see causal well, effects. Well, I, I think we, <laughs> that it's certainly possible to look for, for retrocausal effects, and uh, you can see certain kinds of retrocausal effects going on in quantum mechanics. For Such example, as? The, the uh, uh, Wheeler's um, uh, delayed choice experiment, where you, 
decide after a, uh, a photon has gone through a pair of slits whether you're going to measure it, you know, which way measurement or whether you're going to look at an interference pattern and by doing by choosing the appropriate measurement you cause the photon either to behave like a particle going through only one slit or to behave like a wave going through both slits. And what, what's the duration? How far backwards in time is that? Well, Wheeler claimed, Wheeler pointed out that you could do this with light going around and uh, being uh, uh, gravitationally deflected by a, by a distant galaxy and use that in place of a pair of slits. And so yeah. you, could, you could do it over millions of, you could do it, do it with a separation distance of millions of light years. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I, I think that's a perfectly valid argument. Um, and so you, you, in quantum mechanics, you can see certain retrocausal effects happening like that. But, but nobody has figured out a, a, a way yet of using that to send ma a message from one observer to another in, in, the, in the reverse time direction. Is that, is that restricted by some quantum observational conservation of energy or whatever? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, so there's nothing... I, I think you can you can show, if you take einstein polosky rosen experiments, uh, which have been done with polarization measurements on, uh, on two entangled photons, you can show mathematically that it's not possible to use those polarization measurements to send that sort of information. But there are other other kinds of entangled, uh, enta kinds of entanglement, or momentum entanglement, that don't seem to have the same same kind of restrictions the applied to them, and which, in principle, one might be able to to, uh, to use for sending uh, that sort of <coughs> sort of message. In particular, uh, there's uh, Anton Zeilinger's student uh, Brig Brigitte uh, Dopfer in the 1990s did an experiment when, when he was at Innsbruck uh, in which uh, she demonstrated that by you, you could use two momentum entangled photons and you could cause an interference pattern to come or go that, uh, on, uh, in one photon depending on what, you, what kind of measurement you made on, on the second photon. And that, in principle, would allow you to send uh, 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 messages using quantum non-locality, except that the experiment was done with coincidence measurements, and you'd have to get rid of the coincidence requirement before, before, the, before you could claim that, that this was some kind of non-local signaling. So you have an experiment that you're trying to get to demonstrate? Yeah, I've been trying to do the do some, a variation of the Doppler experiment, not using a pair of slits, but using something a little simpler. Um, Sort of a one a half slit where the <coughs> light goes one way or the other way and produces interference. <coughs> but uh, so far, I've been stymied by the amount of noise that is present in any detector I have access to that can detect single photons. But there are detectors that can detect single photons that have no noise in them, and I, I'm very interested in trying to get a hold of the, this technology so I can pursue these experiments further. But you've been also doing research in time travel paradoxes and... Uh, Not really. I mean, the, 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 I, the time travel paradox business, uh, well, okay, you're talking about writing it up or you're talking about doing experiments about well, it? Well, writing it up with our previous I, I, discussion. For, for Mark Millis's book, Mark Millis and Eric Davis, Davis, Davis's book, uh, I examined the implication, I, I wrote a, a, a chapter about the possibility of non-local communication and I pointed out that if you could use non quantum non-locality to communicate, then in principle you could uh, uh, do, you could create time travel paradoxes in the, in the sense of sending it, uh, information backwards in time. Uh, and, and I proceeded to analyze those paradoxes in the, uh, in, in the book. Um, and the conclusion was that uh, uh, probably there was some, there might be some show, showstopper related to the uncertainty principle that might cause you to might prevent you from doing these kinds of this kind of signaling. But if it if it was possible, then nature would probably insist on some kind of self consistent outcome that would would uh, would not allow you to create a real paradoxical situation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, all of your discussions are, and also, for example, the metamaterials and cloaking and things like that, and are, are quantum level, very near field phenomenon. How, where do we stand in terms of getting these quantum level effects expressible or detectable at a macro level? Does that make sense? Um, the technologies been improving as a function of time. I mean, what what you really need in order to examine a lot of these things better is, first of all, 
a way of producing pairs or, or multiples of entangled photons in an efficient way. Uh, the usual ways of doing it involve down conversion, which is a one in a million, one in a hundred million kind of kind of operation. So you get lots and lots of uh, photons that have nothing to do with what you're trying to do for, for the only, for the pairs that you want. And the other problem is that uh, the me mechanisms we have for detecting single photons by and large have noise associated with them, and so they have to be detected in coincidence with other photons rather than as singles. Uh, I think there are there are technologies coming along which. Uh, get around some of these problems and, and the experiments are getting better and better. What, what do you think What do you think of the future of quantum computing? I think it will come. Um, I saw a paper by some guy who was listing all of the uh, reasons why it was impossible uh, and I read, I read the paper very carefully. Two of his reasons I, I was, were clearly wrong. I'm not sure about the other five. Uh, but I, my, my guess is that quantum computing will, will come along and will revolutionize certain kinds of calculations that we do. And in nuclear physics, I'm an experimental nuclear physicist, and the, um, uh, the kinds of calculations we do for nuclear physics, you either have to uh, make assumptions that are contrary to quantum mechanics. Right? For example, you, in a cascade calculation, you have to collapse the wave function a hundred times where, the, where it would stay uncollapsed in a real quantum mechanical situation. Or, uh, or else you have to emulate the quantum mechanics with great difficulty using complicated integrals that are very difficult to execute in many cases. I think quantum computers will eliminate a lot of those. There will have to be a whole new generation of theoretical nuclear physicists learning how to use these computers uh, to do the appropriate calculations. But I think one will be it will, will revolutionize that particular field that I'm very familiar with, and it will probably have a similar effect all over the place. What other problems, areas, would quantum computing uh, address, do you think? Well, I mean, the, the ones that have been talked about a lot are things like um, factoring prime numbers in order to crack uh, uh, encryption codes and things like that. Uh, the National Security Agency is re reputed to have spent a lot of money supporting quantum computing because they want to get a hold of a quantum computer that will allow you to re read, <coughs> read encrypted mail and so forth. Um, but um, I, I think that, that, that that's a subset of, the, of I, I think that, that, that when quantum computers come along it will become much clearer that there are certain classes of problems that are appropriate for, for dealing with them with and they do, do a very power have, give you a lot of power and there are other problems where quantum computers are not, not of much use and I, I don't have a very good vision of which, which is going to be which no. but I think there will be a big effect in certain areas but not everywhere. Let me get back to the causality consistency issue. If, if, if nature has a way of filtering retro information, uh, the information is going back to modify its own past essentially, theoretically. Um, uh, and it has to maintain consistency, the number one, the easiest way to maintain consistency is enforce causality. Right. Time zero only goes one way. Right. But if it does go back, uh, you know, some of the ideas that I've had on, on, on this is that, one, it, it, it could affect the probability distribution of some event in the past, which is a little bit more likely for the ball to fall on the left instead of the right side. Right. But it's not causal, it's still within the normal distribution. Well, it's a what I, I what I said in this article I was speaking of was that what might come out of being able to send uh, to do to do non-local communication was that you might be able to to uh, push probability distribution in a certain direction oh, okay. uh, in a certain direction in, in a certain way it would give you a very limited capability of manipulating probability. Okay. Um, and um, I don't know how important how how. World-shaking that would be, but it would be certainly an interesting thing to play with. Well, it would be something that would have to be done at a process that was done at very large scale, yeah. such as uh, conception and uh, genetic uh, coupling. So, if it could affect uh, your genetic past, and you could make it a little more likely for a fish to want to come out of the water onto the land, but it might be one in a million. Yeah, but I, I don't think you could do it. Right, I think it, it would have to be done between the sender and the receiver. Uh, Ends of the ends of the system, not something that goes back in time by okay. a million years or something. 
Yeah. Uh, the other thing it would do, of course, is to eliminate the time delay in a lot of communication systems so that NASA would be very interested in it because you could, use, you could drive a Mars rover around on the surface of Mars in real time rather than having to wait uh, minutes or hours to make corrections and, and have it, uh, things that should be autonomous. Um, yeah. Well, in order for this to work, then you, all you need is this, the basic bootstrap back mirror, if you will, the, the, the porthole into the future. The future would be a lot smarter for figuring out the, how to communicate. I mean, I mean, it could tell you to build a better mirror, or whatever. But um, so, but anyway, I mean, talk about all this uh, faster than light travel of starships and stuff like that's going on here. Seems to me that uh, investigating the potential for time travel is is uh, very suitable for this this level of discussion. Yeah, I, not, not something I brought up for, with, with these guys, but. Uh, Something I'd certainly like to talk about. You'd like to do hardware, <laughs> given the occasion. A little green but, to, but, to, but tomorrow I'm, I'm talking about uh, reaching the stars by, by accelerating a wormhole to a high, very high velocities and shooting them at the stars, and using relativistic time dilation to get there almost instantaneously. So you fly through the wormhole. You, you send the send the wormhole there. Send momentum bearing particles through it to steer it uh, around the yeah. way, where you want it. You land it and then you expand it and get out and, and explore the planet. I see. Uh, <laughs> and how much energy does that take? <laughs> well, no, nobody knows because nobody, I mean, <clears throat> this is the, the exotic physics section and the, the uh, exotic, what exotic physics means is that you need at least one visit for the tooth fairy in order to make it work. <laughs> Yeah, Werner Vinci likes to say that you can only put one uh, violation of a natural law in his novel. So. Yeah, it's well, thank, like that. Thank you very much. Anything else you want to say on the video? Not really. Okay, thank you.